So good evening and welcome to the IHD Silver Jubilee Lecture by the rather the third Silver Jubilee Lecture by Ms. Sunita Narayan, who is Director General Center for Science and Environment, New Delhi. We are very thrilled and very excited, ma'am, that you have agreed to deliver this lecture. The topic of this lecture is the urban agenda in our climate risk times, urgency of building and rebuilding resilient and inclusive cities. As you are all aware, IHD is celebrating 25 years of its founding this year, and this silver, the Silver Jubilee uh, celebrations commenced on 25th January 2023 by a lecture by uh, Professor Hajun Chang of SOAS London. The second one was on 3rd August by Professor Albert Park of ADB. And this Silver Jubilee lecture is part of several lectures, conferences, activities of the year long IHD Silver Jubilee celebrations to be concluded in January 2024. This lecture is being chaired by Professor Deepak Nayar. He's chairman of IHD New Delhi, and Professor Emirates. Is Jawaharlal Nehru University and former Vice Chancellor of University of Delhi. We are very thankful to you, sir, to, uh, for agreeing to chair this lecture. And now I invite the Director of the Institute for Professor uh, of the Inst Institute for Human Development, Professor Alakhan Sharma, to please commence the proceedings of this session with his welcome remarks. Uh, Professor Deepak Nayar, Ms. Sumita Narayan, uh, ladies and gentlemen, as my colleague Priyanka just said that uh, it is uh, uh, part of uh, our third, third Silver Jubilee lecture. Uh, uh, this conference is also uh, part of the activities of Silver Jubilee. This is the uh, second conference. Uh, we thought that uh, 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 your attention, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm not going to take uh, much time, maybe a couple of minutes, uh, just a formality to welcome and thank uh, Ms. Sunita Narayan for being here on a very short notice. I had given the option to her to give the lecture anytime before December, but I suggested her to uh, give this lecture, ISD Silver Jubilee lecture, if it is possible for her uh, during the conference. Uh, because uh, I think at least one fourth of the entire 180 papers in the conference relate to environment and sustainability. Uh, so what can be better occasion than, and you must be uh, tired with many presentations since nine in the morning, uh, parallel six sessions, many people are confused where to go. So here there will be very fresh air for you. Ms. Sunita Narayan is one of the most outstanding environmentalists uh, of global frame in India who influences our policy discourse. Already a handout has been given to you about her, so I won't take much time. Uh, apart from many other things, you can imagine she was also judged uh, uh, in 2016, but Time Magazine uh, selected her as one of the most influential people in the world because of her work on environment, rather say, she is a crusader on environmental justice. So I won't take much time. Uh, uh, thanks very much uh, to you, Ms. Sunita Narayan, for being with us. And uh, I now give it to Professor Deepak Nayar to conduct the session. We have only uh, one hour, uh, and there must be some time for question and answer. So Professor Deepak Nayar and Sunita Narayan have to decide how to do it. 
Well, neither Sunita nor I are magicians. <laughs> we'll do our best. Sir, I'll uh, just take a uh, minute. Uh, 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 before we formally commence, I would just like to thank all the online attendees who've joined. And this is an announcement for them. The Q&A box has been opened. You can place your questions through the Q&A box. Thank you very much. Thank, uh, Priyanka, I'm going to speak for 30 seconds. Shall I do it from here? Or yes. you? Uh, uh, welcome, Sunita. It is both a, a, a pleasure and a privilege to have you in our midst this evening. Uh, I am going to, the less I say, the better. The best chairperson is a silent chairperson. Uh, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you, Deepak Ji. It's such a pleasure to see you. It's been a long time, and I'm so happy to be here in your presence. So thank you very much. And thank you, Sharma Ji, for asking me. I've learned one thing in life, that you delay a decision, and it comes to haunt you. So now I tend to say, OK, if I'm free on a particular day and I can do it, let me do it now. Because otherwise, I'll sort of say, OK, some point over this year, I'll do it. And it will only get more and more messy. So thank you, everyone. And I think, uh, as Sharma Ji, as Priyanka has just said, You've had an amazing um, day and a half, two days, I think, up till now, and uh, you've heard so much. I'm not sure what I can add, but let me sort of explain to you as we, as um, an institution working in the field of environment are looking at the agenda of urbanization. And what do we see as the challenges uh, past challenges, new challenges, but also I want to share with you with some excitement, the opportunities that are emerging in our world. And the fact that we are beginning to see change happen at scale, but that change requires courage and imagination. And the question therefore becomes for all of us, in this room that as we you know hurtle the world towards a crisis do will we have the ability to make that change at the scale and pace that is needed so it's very clear that we have a crisis on our hands and i'm talking about climate change i'm talking about the extreme weather events that are happening in our world and you've read about it and the one thing that we've understood with climate change is that the world is one. That if the poor are impacted today and the poor are victims of climate change, the one thing about climate change is that it is about, it's a great leveler. It's a great um, equalizer because every part of the world is impacted. And climate change should teach us as humans, which we are not learning, and I want to develop this idea because this is also the idea for Indian cities is that climate change should teach us that unless we have inclusive growth, unless it is equitable, it can never be sustainable. That we cannot have an effective climate agreement unless we talk about equity, inclusion, the right to development of the poorest in the world. And that then becomes the agenda for our cities. The fact is, we've had a crisis even before we've added another layer of climate change. We have a problem of lack. And the major problem, as far as I, we can see, is that there is a lack of an idea of what does urbanization mean in the global south. We really do not have models of urbanization for the global south. We have adopted a paradigm of growth, of urban growth, which has happened in other parts of the world faster than us. And our vision of a modern city is, if I asked you all to close your eyes and think of a city, 
I mean, I'm not sure all of you would do so because you're wiser and you're, you're better informed, but I can tell you most people that I would speak to, I would say, close your eyes and think of a modern city. And they would say, oh, New York. And of course now it's Shanghai, but it's London. It's, that is the vision of what is a city. And that's been the model that we have in the South followed for a lack of an alternative vision. The problem with this model of urban growth has been that it worked when there was sufficient capital to invest in public infrastructure. And I mean sufficient capital. And that capital, if you look at the history of urbanization that happened in the already developed world, it happened on the backs of colonialism. It happened on the backs of the time when the, when the rich world had sufficient money to invest in public infrastructure. And also it happened at a time when the world, which was building the cities, had enough money to subsidize the needs of all. So you could build an infrastructure which would as best as possible be as affordable to large numbers of people. So it was subsidized to maintain the semblance of what inclusive growth would be. But it does not work for us. And we have learned that if you look at the cities that we have built, it just does not work for us. The sheer capital intensity of the urban growth model means that you essentially divide between the rich and the poor. It is inherently an inequitable model of growth. It is not about uh, the fact that our planners don't think about equity. It's built into the model that you have, it is extremely capital intensive and at for countries which don't have enough capital to subsidize the needs of all. It's also extremely resource intensive. And because it is resource intensive, the adverse impact of resource utilization is overuse, it's also pollution. And so this model, the cost of abatement of pollution is so massive that it actually then further feeds the inequitable nature of that model. Now, let me unpack this riddle because these are words that academics understand much more better. I am a practitioner more than an academic. So for me, I learn from experience, from what I have seen. Let me unpack this for you. Let me take an example of the issue of water supply in cities, critical, absolutely critical. We need the provisioning of safe, clean, affordable water for every citizen of our cities and ever growing cities. But the fact is in this model of resource utilization, we essentially develop a system in which we bring water from further and further away. We do this and it adds to the fact that you have huge distribution losses, your pipeline leaks. By the time the water reaches the first point where it has to be distributed, only half the water remains at best. And as a result of it, the cost of that water doubles. Then the state does not have the money to provide water to all. And it can provide water to some. If you look at the gross inequity in the city of Delhi, this part of Delhi, which I call Deepakji, I'm sorry, forgive me, I call it Lutai in Delhi. <laughs> okay. Uh, in Lutai in Delhi, the per capita water supply is close to 300 to 400 liters per capita per day. Most of Delhi does not even get 30 liters per capita per day. 
Now, the fact is Delhi's water supply model is one where you get the water upstream at Wazirabad, you clean it it's with Sonia Bihar and others, you then lay down pipelines all the length and breadth of Delhi. By the time the pipelines reach the entire city, you essentially have both run out of water and the pipelines are leaking. Now that's one part of the challenge, but the other part of the challenge, which is getting even worse, is the fact that the state today, because water is a political issue, supply of water is a political issue. We understand when politicians talk about, yes, in elections, I haven't got water. So supply of water is there. But the fact is, if you get 100 liters of water in your house, 80 liters leaves it as sewage. Now, the problem with this model of growth is that you spend, firstly, you don't have enough to supply to all, but let's say you do even. You run out of money because you can't supply to all and yet take back the waste of all. Now, economists would argue, Deepak Ji, that this is all about pricing, okay? It isn't, because if I add the cost of water supply to the cost of taking back the sewage, intercepting it, conveying it, treating it, and disposing it into the river, which has already lost its assimilative capacity, then even the richest in the city cannot afford the cost of water supply. Now that's the crisis of unaffordability. That's the crisis of non-inclusion. But the crisis, and this is really where a lot of the learnings that we've had have kicked in, is that you, you cannot talk about cleaning your rivers, which is what the whole effort is, unless you provide sanitation for all. Why? If you look at the city of Delhi, and I can give you examples for almost all cities of India because we do something called a shit flow diagram. So we've done shit flow diagrams for city after city in India to understand where does the shit come from, where does the shit go, how much of it is treated. But if you take, for example, the city of Delhi right now, we're here, let's understand the city of Delhi. 60 to 70% of Delhi is still unconnected to the official sewerage system. Please understand this, because for most of us, the fact is we flush and we forget. Water supply is such something you can still see a leaking tap. You don't understand the sewerage and the political economy of sewerage and defecation in our country. 60% of Delhi is unconnected to an official sewerage system. Most of India is unconnected to an official sewerage system. Now this means that the entire effort is to intercept, say the waste of IIC, where I live, intercept it, treat it, take it to an official treatment plant. But that's only the waste of 40% at best. Most of it in any case does not reach, but let's say 40% reaches. The rest of the 60% goes into drains which meet the river. They're unofficial sewerage, they're unrecognized, and as a result of it, you have pollution. So unless you have a paradigm of sewage management, which is affordable for all, you can never clean your rivers. And the fact is that as you don't clean your rivers, the cost of water supply doubles. So which is the city which is downstream of Delhi? Agra, Mathura. In Agra, the water supply plant that has been set up by the city is equivalent to a sewage treatment plant because they get sewage in the Yamuna. But remember, we all live downstream. And as the city above us is going to have the same problem of unconnected sewage systems, you basically get pollution. 
the cost of water supply, treating water goes up, the cost of water supply goes up. Now, I'll switch. Give you another example. Take the issue of air pollution. Most of you who are sitting in this audience would know that I'm a rabid. I have been rabid, strident, everything to try and clean up Delhi's air. Um, I, we were fortunate. We were part of a Supreme Court committee. We pushed for clean air by transforming, moving towards compressed natural gas, arguing that if you move to gas, you essentially leapfrogged and you got much lower emissions than just incrementally cleaning up diesel. It happened. But then all the gains we made in early 2000 were lost because we forgot the fact that we have a huge challenge of growth of private vehicles. So we have massive numbers of vehicles coming on the road. We're cleaning each vehicle, new emission norms, better fuel, but then we are adding 10 times more vehicles. And the impact of that is negated. The other fact of the matter is that we have large numbers of people who still don't have access to clean cooking fuel. We have large numbers of industry that still depend on dirty coal for, uh, for uh, industrial operations. All that adds to the airshed of Delhi, makes us choke, makes us ill. Now, if you look at this from an inclusion point of view, the fact is that only 15% of Delhi still commutes by car, only 15%. Yet cars occupy 90% of our road space. And you will be shocked to know, Deepakji, almost 26% of the land area of the city of Delhi is under roads, flyovers, and all the infrastructure you need to keep the personal mobility system going off a minuscule number. People like us. Now, the, the point again is, you can never get clean air unless you provide for the mobility needs of the 85% which are going to move from a two-wheeler, a cycle, a bus, wherever else, to a car. And you don't have the airshed for it. You don't have the road space for it. And so you can never plan on the right for clean air. You cannot get your right to clean air unless you have an inclusive model of city planning, which plans for road users, based on equity. The High Court of Delhi, about 10 years ago, gave a very interesting order. They said, we should plan to provide space on the road based on how many people use it. Equity of road use. Too inconvenient. Because if you put those maths together, you will understand that the maximum road usage is actually not by people like me who travel in a car. We are inefficient resource users. The maximum road users are people who walk, who cycle, who bus, who take the metro. So that's really where the rubber meets the road that you need to think about unless you reinvent your mobility systems, you cannot get the right to clean air. You think about it from the point of view of incomplete combustion. Large numbers of women still cooking on inefficient, extremely polluting uh, cook stoves using biomass. Excellent scheme by the government of India, the Ujjwala scheme. I love the call to action to say, you know, middle class, give up your subsidy. We need it for the poor. The fact is gas prices have gone up to such an extent. Refills are not available to people. They're back to biomass. Okay. You cannot get your right to clean air unless everybody has affordable, clean energy. We have a huge challenge. The city of Delhi thought it had cleaned itself, and so it moved its industries out into the hinterland. Hinterland meaning Faridabad, Ghaziabad, Noida, Greater Noida, Gurgaon, Sahibabad. I mean, we forgot. Ashad is one. Okay. 
And we forgot the fact that industry in India does not get electricity at affordable prices. Gas is unavailable to it. So it uses the dirtiest of fuel, which is coal. Okay. It uses it in inefficient boilers and adds to huge amount of pollution. So again, the question is, you cannot get your right to clean air unless you talk about how will you get affordable electricity in the hands of both poor women and also industry. And that's part of the challenge that is there. So on all this, now we have a new challenge of climate change. And climate change is manifesting itself very fast. I mean, we are still at 0.7 degree centigrade rise over the post-industrial or the pre-industrial era. And we are expecting that we will cross 1.5 degrees by the end of this century, by all accounts at the current rates of growth that we have. Just think at 0.7 degrees temp temperature rise, what is the devastation we are seeing in our world? Today, it does not rain, it pours. So my organization, the Center for Science and Environment has been tracking extreme weather events in, in India. And you will be shocked to know, Deepakji, that last year we recorded one event a day, one extreme weather event a day. Ex extreme weather as defined by IMD. Too much rain, too much uh, uh, landslide, um, uh, flooding, um, 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 lightning uh, strikes. They've defined it. Now, the poorer victims, but we are really seeing the impact in our cities. And there are three impacts that we are beginning to see. One, flooding, huge challenge of flooding in our cities, massive. It does not rain, it pours. And we in our cities, because we are so mindless in terms of growth, and again, it connects back to my water paradigm that I talked about. We didn't think we needed to keep our groundwater systems going in our cities. We didn't think we needed our lakes, our ponds, our sponges in our cities. We didn't need them because we were getting the water from Terry Dam, getting it all the way from Terry Dam to Delhi. Why do I need to protect my lake and my pond? I mean, any economist will tell you land use, what an inefficient use of land. I mean, build a skyscraper there, build a mall there, monetize that land property, because that's what growth was all about. Today, we have no place for the water to go when it rains. We have a huge challenge of flooding and devastation in destruction of poverty. Sorry, I have this habit of, uh, I, I can see that uh, the guys there are getting agitated. Take care. Miri Adate Karna, Thorasa jump, Thorasa jump karega, Thoradura. The second is heat. Now, uh, heat is a big issue for cities, particularly as extreme heat is going to go up. Uh, we are building in a way that is completely insane. I mean, how many have been to Gurgaon? I'm sure everyone has. Yeah, you're, you're too shy to put your hands up. Everyone has been to Gurgaon, okay? So please look at the glass cladded buildings that we are making. It is completely insane that in a country like India, you would make buildings with glass. Glass to wall ratio should have been one in which you actually planned with nature. You planned for passive architecture. You planned in a way that you could have ventilation. No, because for us, a green building and what is called a lead building or something like that, that's those certification schemes, <laughs> is when you build with glass, but that glass is very, very therm thermally uh, effective. It is double, triple glass, extremely expensive, and of course, the people who sit in the committee who make the 
uh, the, the rules for what is a green building are glass manufacturers. Are you surprised? <laughs> okay. But that's the challenge of heat in our buildings and the question of thermal comfort today, which is going to be the second big challenge. The third connected challenge is diseases. We will see more diseases as climate change happens. You're beginning to see cholera coming back in large parts of Africa because of the flooding incidents. You, we've always had dengue. We will have more dengue now because rainfall patterns will become more erratic. Conditions for uh, vectors to, uh, to breed will become better. Why? Because you will get intermittent rainfall. You'll get a burst of rainfall. You'll get intense heat best conditions. They love it. And we are doing nothing to make sure that we clean up our cities so we do not have places for mosquitoes can breed. So disease will become the third part of the climate change urban challenge. And the fourth part, which is not about climate change alone, and I please remember every time I use the word climate change, I talk about climate change as an exacerbating factor as something that tips us over. Nothing is only climate change. It is about the way we do our growth, okay? But the fourth issues which will get exacerbated is migration. I don't know how many of you, and I'm sure you have visited large parts of the outlying areas of any city in India or in Africa, you will see huge numbers of people coming into our cities in search of work. Now, the good thing is, Deepakji, that we have decided not to do a census. <laughs> so we do not have any data, okay? We do not know. And so it's very nice because I actually can tell you that there are very large numbers of people uh, working in uh, these very bad conditions at the outskirts of uh, Delhi, which I have visited. But you can tell me that there is no official data on it, which is true because there is no census. And the last census we had was 2011. 2011, we really don't know that cities have grown at the scale they have. We're still living within that notion 30% or 70%. But sorry, I did I, 30 and 70. That's the sort of in normal thing. 30% is urbanization in India. So I think with climate change, with the tipping over, with the fact that you are going to see more and more uh, marginalization of people, you will see more uh, migration. It's not only climate change, but it is also climate change. So those are really where the challenge of urbanization gets even tougher as we go on. But I promised you that I'm not here to give you a, a, a tale of woe. I'm here to tell you the opportunities. And I think that's what's exciting. So, we know cities are engines of growth. We also know that cities are responsible to, for the bulk of climate emissions. We also know that there is this crisis is actually pushing for new solutions. Let me give you the solution that I'm most excited about. So I work a lot, uh, as you have probably gathered by now, Deepakji, on excreta, on shit, as it is called. I actually wrote a two volume report called Excreta Matters where we look city after city in terms of where does the water come from, where does the sewage go? And we have been pushing this whole idea that we in India really need to reinvent our sewage system. Because as I said, it is capital intensive, it is resource intensive, it is inequitable. And unless we can have an inclusive sewage system, you cannot provide for sewage for all, sanitation for all, you cannot clean your rivers. Now, given that, one of the things that has emerged has been, let's go back to and back to, and I'm, I'm very deliberately using this word because this is, the, this is the word that engineers and others say to me, we're going backwards, we're going back to. So we said, let's go back to what people are doing today. After all, everybody is human, everybody eats, everybody excretes, there must be some system at work. So the system at work today is either a septic tank or a tank or any system in which 
you basically excrete and it gets pumped to the neighboring, to the outlying area. You have a huge body of informal septage tank collectors, which collect the sewerage, treat uh, and take it, and they dispose it everywhere. If you came to our office in uh, Tuklakabad institutional area, and I love our office there rather than Habitat Center, because we go through the republics of Kanpur and the largest slum of Sangam Bihar. And if you come to our office, right in front of our office, every night you will see these large tankers pumping the sewage into the official mains. What are they doing? They brought the sewage and they're pumping it. So the, the, the question was, can you not make the past part of the future? We've accepted the fact that that sewage system exists in the world, in our world. It's an imperfect system. Can we not talk about what we can do to make it part of the future? What would it take to make it part of the future would mean that you would regulate the collection of the sewage. You would not build your underground sewage uh, uh, systems. You would believe in tankers, which would collect the sewage and then take it to a sewage treatment plant where it would be treated. But most importantly, it would not be disposed of in water. It would be disposed of back at land, which means that the phosphorus and nutrients that you have in the excreta of human beings would be reutilized on land, not cleaned so that you would put it back into water and add to water pollution. Think about it like the great cell phone revolution. I mean, I am old enough and I'm very old and I can tell you that when I was, we were setting up CSC, Deepak Ji will remember, um, we didn't have a telephone line and Anil being Anil dispatched me to say, go find telephone lines. And I found, in fact, it was Jairam Ramesh who was OST that time in the planning commission. And he had to sign off on the telephone lines that we would get as a favor to us so that we would get a telephone line at CSC. Um, today, we all have cell phones, connectivity. We talk about the fact that we have more cell phones than we have toilets. Uh, it's connected. We change the system. Now, why can't we think about the same thing when it comes to sewage? Instead of going through the land-based system, you go through a system in which you basically connect every household, which is already connected, to a mobile tanker, which then takes the sewage to a treatment plant where it is treated. And most importantly, you don't, as I said, you keep it, you, you reutilize the sewage back on the land. Now, the good thing here is, and I'm very excited to tell you this, that this is a paradigm which has actually caught not just policymakers but also practice. If all of you go to the state of Orissa today, Orissa has stopped making uh, underground sewage systems across the state, the length and breadth of the state. It's a far more nimble system. It's a system of not in my backyard because if the sewage is overflowing, I'm going to call somebody. If my river is polluted, I'm just going to feel sad about it. So, and now the government of India and SBM 2.0 has actually now said that this is part of policy. It's taken huge resistance, still massive resistance from the engineers who believe this is a system which will breed cholera and you know all the rest of it, but it's happening. So I see the paradigm shift requiring that kind of imagination, courage to be able to say, well, you know, maybe it was the past, but it can be part of the future. What can we do to modernize it? What are our needs? How do we make it affordable? If it is affordable, if it is inclusive, it will be sustainable. How do you make sure that you treat, treat the sewage and put it back on land? CSE has a lab. We have a lab for testing fecal sludge. And we've just done a report on both the, the treatment plants, but also the biosolids that are coming out of it and trying to understand whether the biosolids can be reutilized on land and why not. 
And that's really what is exciting. My other very quick example would be air. I talked about air pollution. I talked about the crisis of health in our cities. I talked about the crisis of inclusive growth, but turn it around, turn it around. I mean, why can't we have the imagination of thinking of our cities so that we move people and not cars? I mean, you can buy your car, it's a status symbol. You decide the, uh, the uh, you know, your marriage based on it, your status in life based on just the number of cars you have and how big they are, unfortunately, now in India and how heavy they are. And I'm told that a heavy car can be clean, which is an oxymoron, but nevertheless, uh, you can do all that. But why can't we think of our cities so that you had the right to walk, the right to cycle? That's 80% of our cities today. We're not talking about cute cyclists in other parts of the world. We're talking about invisible people in our cities. We're talking about planning for them. But it's a tough one. Yes, it's a tough one because you have to make a public investment so that it is affordable for large numbers of people who cannot even afford to take a bus today. So your metro, your bus, your auto rickshaw, and the last mile connectivity to it has to be one which is affordable for large numbers of people. And it has to be modern enough, convenient enough for the rich to get off their car and into the system, which also means putting price on parking, doing everything else which would restrain it. Uh, I could go on and on, so just keep me on time, please. Okay. Another five minutes? Five minutes. Okay. Perfect. So then yeah, I, will, I will cut short a few things and move on. Uh, I think the biggest agenda that, I, that I'm very excited about is the agenda of NIMBY, not in my backyard. We've all grown up as NIMBY. an environmentalist. NIMBY is something that we've all grown up with. But Deepak Ji, NIMBY has always been NIMBY of the rich. Okay, you and I do not want an incinerator in our backyard. We fight against nuclear power, but we do not want it in our backyard. If it's not in our backyard, it's in somebody else's backyard. Look at the city of Delhi. Look at every city of India, where all the waste dumps are always in the backyard of the poor. Now, what I'm very excited about is that NIMBY is turning on its head today. It's changing the urban agenda. Because the NIMBY is not of the rich, but by the poor. So if you take an example of waste, simple issue of garbage, not a single city today, Deepak Ji, can find land for what is called a green site, landfill site. They cannot find it. Because no village, nobody wants a landfill in their backyard. And today they have a voice. They can say no. The most classic example was one of Kerala, where the city of Tiruvanthapuram didn't have a place to send its garbage because the city, uh, the village outside it said no. And they finally had to learn to segregate their waste because if they didn't, there was no way they would not drown in their waste. So I just want to end this by saying, to me, the urban agenda is one of a crisis, as I explained, but it's one of enormous uh, opportunity for reinvention. But that reinvention will require us to keep always in our sights the fact that if it is not inclusive, it cannot be sustainable. That's something that we in the South and the countries of the South need to take to the tables across the world. Because today, the climate change agenda is also an agenda that needs to speak the same language to say that if it is not inclusive, if it's not equitable, it will never be ambitious, it will never be effective. And that's really the lesson and the opportunity that I find that we have. But it takes courage, it will take imagination, and most of all, it'll take breaking down the mental barriers that we have built up in our world, which essentially force us always towards status quo. What is easy? What is convenient? What we know has been done is something that we are best in practicing. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Sunita, for that eloquent, passionate, illuminating lecture. It has been a pleasure, a joy to listen to you, and I'm sure that the audience shares my, my view. Um, I'm just looking at the clock. Uh, I wish there were more time for questions. Alas, there will not be, uh, but I will try and set aside 15 minutes uh, in which there can be questions and answers from Sunita Ji. Um, so may I now turn to the floor to invite questions, but may I request you please, no long comments, no long observations. And can I, should I collect the questions? Yes, so that then I, was going, I, I was going to suggest that I will do two rounds, okay? And I'll take one question from my left, two from, well, one from each segment of, of the auditorium. So I'll take four questions and you can take them in, in sequence. Uh, I see you, uh, please, the first hand I see in each segment, I will, the lady there, Partha there and here, right. Yeah, we're done. Yeah. Uh, thank you. It's always a ple uh, pleasure to listen to you, uh, Ms. Narayan. Uh, I would be very uh, straight in my uh, question. Uh, we have seen a global agenda for loss and damage emerging at Shramal Sheikh, but we have no clarity on national loss and damage framework, right? And you have talked about that the poor are bearing the brunt for whatever has been done by the rich. How do we see happening that in India? And uh, also in historical context, are we thinking of compensation and reparations for Dalit, for Adivasis, for historically marginalized communities? for all that, because their emissions, if we ever do calculation, have never been same for the others, right? So how do we see that happening at the national level and what are your views on it? Thank you. Thank you. The lady there. Um, and can I also request if people can just introduce themselves into the context? Good evening, ma'am. I'm Uma. Uh, I have worked on solid waste management and the NIMBY effect is a lot there uh, in Patna City. So I have a question about when you talk about the tanker. So the tanker will again create the NIMBY effect. It will go to the poorer area and because right now what we are facing with solid rate management, it will be the same for the septic tanks and it going to the land. So I have a like, how do you see the solution there? Thank you. Thank you for the brevity. Uh, no, uh, Partha, I'm taking the hands in the order I saw them in each segment. So please forgive me. So uh, I think you, I've Deepak. got it right. And, and thank you, Sunita. Very lovely uh, talk. Um, let me um, plug three things. Um, first, in uh, in Orissa, I'm so glad you mentioned that. A lot of work by my uh, colleagues at CPR. Uh, and one of the interesting things I'd like your response to is um, the fact that a lot of these uh, STPs or FSTPs, fecal slash treatment plants, are actually now being managed by uh, self-help groups of women. Uh, and that is uh, an additional, do you see that as something that is empowering or something that is, you know, hence marginalized, let them do the stuff uh, structure going forward. And secondly, I would like your opinion on, uh, you spoke about uh, pricing and economists. So why shouldn't we just tax cars, large, big cars, which are supposed to be clean, as you said, and make buses free, if you really want people to take buses? Uh, it's not that hard. The kind of resources that you would need to run buses, and now that we have this stuff, is about maybe 10, 20,000 rupees per car, per year. Uh, so, um, list of responses to how you would respond. Thank you. Thank you. Ruth? Ruth Steiner, University of Florida. Um, uh, many of your solutions are what you might call out of the box, innovative solutions. Um, many of the 
re, they're in response to what I would see as major crises and major that have have risks associated with it. Uh, and yet the advantage of incremental solutions is you can adjust along the way. I'm wondering though, how you think about that whole, the, the risks associated with changing systems that, uh, or the risk associated with innovation. Thank you. Uh, Sunita, the floor is yours. Okay, let me take Ruth's question first. Ruth, uh, very interesting. And I think there is a risk always, but I think the risk over, I think there is, I mean, not doing that innovative solution and doing incremental step-by-step -step changes um, is, you know, is not going to work. I'll give you a simple example. When we moved towards compressed natural gas, we were told that every bus would burn in Delhi because there was such high risks attached to gas, inflammability, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and in fact, every bus did burn, but very interestingly, only when the night before the Supreme Court was going to listen to the case. Okay, so till the point where the judges said that, you know, we're not that stupid that the bus burns only one night before. But so the point is, there is risk, but that's what is needed for us to stand behind and to keep moderating and looking for solutions and to keep working so that we can keep finding ways of being able to improve that system as it goes on. No system is going to go from A to B and just be perfect. But the fact is, and the problem and the crisis today, Ruth, is we don't have enough courage to stand behind our own ideas. We don't have enough patience to see the change we want to see. Because we just, oh, we gave an idea, government took it, it's there, it's gone, it's done. No, it's not done. Okay? You need to stand behind it at every level and keep saying, okay, that FSTP was built today, we are finding they're over-designed. We, uh, we need to make the FSTPs different. We are not reusing the sludge of it. We need to use the sludge of it. Those tankers, and I will then get to her question, uh, the tankers, the fact is those tankers do collect from poor areas, they do dump the waste in poorer areas. Today, what you want is a GPS on every tanker, you want to regulate the tankers. So instead of investing in the underground sewerage system, what I'm arguing for about is, in Patna city, you have an incredible, I mean, a whole plethora of tanker owners, okay? They collect and they dump. You have no clue where they go. Okay? You need to organize them, bring them to a treatment plant, treat the waste, and of course, then reutilize the waste. That's the point. Okay? So it can be done. It's not impossible that you cannot do it. And it will be, and the question, so now as Ruth asked, I mean, the big question is, so we, we, we UP government has now decided to do um, uh, to move towards a non sewerage system approach, okay, which is incredible, okay, and they are now saying that the tankers will pick up the sewerage and they will take it to a treatment plant, a co-treatment plant, or an FSTP. But they have put a, a business model in which the tanker operator collects the waste, charging three thousand rupees per uh, emptying to take it to the FSTP. Now, which part of UP is going to pay 3,000 rupees for emptying? I mean, kya soj ke policy banai? Okay, uski market economics are like that, that unless you collect it at 3,000 per household, the operator doesn't have enough to pay for their capex, their opex. So I don't believe the government, but this is where Ruth, you need to stand behind the idea. You need to do more research. You need to find out what are different models. What is the model that can operate the different model in Orissa, which is based on self-help group, a different model in Tamil Nadu, which is based on taxation in property tax. What are the models that will work? So there is, that's where the inventiveness and the research comes in. That's where standing behind the change comes in. And I think from uh, Partha, really the tax, the cars, and you know, free the buses, wonderful, just try and do it. I did, I did, okay? I have petition after petition in the Supreme Court on it, okay? I'd love it. I mean, I'd love somebody to have that courage, even I don't have. 
Um, and your question on loss and damage, I think, you know, it's a very complicated question, but clearly equity is important both in the country as well as outside the country. And that is going to be part of the challenges as you design a loss and damage framework. Thank you, Sunita. Simple, brief, clear, uh, all the answers. Um, now, in the interest of equity, I'm going to questions from those who have joined us out online, okay? Uh, and uh, I'm going to use my prerogative as chair. There are six questions. I will put three to you, okay? Um, first, the lecture is so Delhi-centric. Any thoughts on Pan-India? Two, to how can you make Indian cities land so many decades back undergo major transitions in water systems or sewerage that would bring massive disruptions? Mm -hmm. Three, what would be the possible solution for small towns where sewerage systems are not yet developed, where water systems are un underdeveloped, yet the demographic pressures are very high in small towns too. Three. Excellent questions. Thank you very much, uh, the, uh, uh, the viewers from online. Uh, and forgive me, it is Delhi-centric, but you know, it's a habit. When I'm in Delhi and I see everybody here and they are sitting in Delhi and you believe Delhi is such a beautiful city because you've come here and, you know, it's a, I mean, I, so my first experience was this Deepak Ji was when Anil, uh, and you know, Anil was quite a difficult man, as you know. So when Anil uh, went to see some official, and this is a long time ago, so I think people have changed and become much better now. But went to see somebody uh, in the government and Delhi was choking with air pollution. This is mid nineties. And the person turned around and said, Achha, Delhi mein pollution hai. You know, and I, I can understand, you know, it's so green, it's so clean, it's so beautiful. What is the crisis of urbanization we're talking about? So I kind of use Delhi as an example, more as an example. It's, of course, my city. Uh, I come from Delhi. I come from old Delhi. Uh, but it's also my city of work where I have been and I have worked. But it is also very reflective about the crisis that happens across the country. And I think for, this, for people who are here, I use those examples more provocatively, more deliberately, but I can assure you we have data on virtually every city of India, and I can assure you the situation is not different. I can give you statistics city after city on the mobility pattern, and I will tell you most cities use even less uh, public private transport than even Delhi, okay? Uh, but, uh, and they also have a crisis of pollution. So, but forgive me, I think it's very right to have called me out on it. So thank you for calling me out on uh, uh, being so Delhi-centric, something I really would not like to be. Uh, the disruption issue, very important. I think, I mean, I think what we are really talking about is scaling up today. And we are scaling up new solutions and that's what disruption is about. Uh, disruption is not about doing everything that you've been doing up till now and calling it uh, disruptive because you've added an AI component to it. It is not disruptive. Okay, uh, It's going to be disruptive if you really get uh, to meet the needs of all. And I think that's, and as I said, for me, I'm an environmentalist. I'm actually not a social activist. I'm an environmentalist. What do I care about? Uh, sanitation for all. I mean, you know, it's somebody else's problem. But it isn't, because if you want clean rivers, you will have to treat the sewerage of everybody. And in, as I explained to you, you cannot do so unless you change the paradigm of sewage management. So I think the disruption is part of uh, the nature of the crisis we're in. And I can tell you that the crisis demands us to be much more bolder much more, uh, um, uh, I don't know what's the word, um, I, it's not ambitious, but it's just about, you know, having the courage to say, why not? I mean, I know when we talked about this non-sewered sanitation systems, you can imagine how, 
how much resistance there was to the very idea of saying, you know, but it will never work because, you know, we need underground sewerage. We need, you know, so, but you need to find those ideas. You need to work with them and you need to make them work. And that's really where the small town issue comes in. I mean, small town issue are today really uh, where the mess is the maximum. And it doesn't need to be, because if I look at a small town and uh, anyone who works on solid waste will know that if I connect, if I, uh, if I put two pie diagrams in front of you, one of rich Hyderabad and the other one of poor, a poor city in Bihar, the one thing that will be big difference will be the quantity of non-biodegradable waste. Hyderabad will have 60% non-biodegradable waste, and only 40% of its waste now will be degradable wet waste. Poor cities will be 80% non-biodegradable, uh, degradable waste, which means that the opportunity to take that waste, and today the most exciting opportunity has been that you take that waste, you segregate it, you not just make compost out of it, you can actually make gas out of it, you can run your vehicles on it. That's the bio CNG project. That's where resource utilization reaches that other level. Small town India does not have underground sewerage. Why are we making underground sewerage? Small town India does, has huge opportunity of reinventing its transport system because it is the best part transport system today. If I asked all of you to close your eyes and this I can tell you, I guarantee you, you will, uh, you will get this wrong. If I tell you what's a good transport system, close your eyes and tell me, and you will tell me that any transport system that operates in any big city, and I will tell you the transport system that operates in any small city, which is paratransit, which is cycle, which is walk, which is, uh, auto, which is uh, cycle rickshaw, which is two-wheeler, which is where the pace of you know, there's so much mess on the road that you cannot have an accident. Because even if you have an accident, nobody will die because there's no speed. Okay, that's the best transport system. But then you have to reinvent your cities so that you have workplace and, and home is close. I mean, those are, that's what you can do in small town India. But we are not. So thank you for the question. I think great uh, opportunity there. Well. Uh, all good things must come to an end, uh, in part because time and patience are both exhaustible resources. Um, and it's been a long day for, for everyone. Um, it's difficult for me to find the words, and I am a wordsmith, to thank Sunita for what was a masterly public lecture. This is, this is the art of a public lecture, that you can communicate uh, a depth of knowledge with decades of experience in a simple, clear way. And you did that. Uh, what I liked in particular was the analysis of the problem, the diagnosis of what went wrong and why, and the prescriptions, albeit selective, uh, given the time available, uh, in terms of innovative solutions, or what Ruth called out-of-the-box solutions. Um, I will just make three points uh, for you, and indeed uh, for all of us to reflect on. I don't know the answers. Yeah. Uh, economists have a bad habit when they don't know the answers, they change the questions. I'm not going to do that. Uh, uh, you, you began by saying that climate change is a leveler. I think you're partly right, but you're partly wrong. Let me explain. You are right that in terms of its consequences as they are unfolding, uh, whether it's floods, forest fires, uh, temperatures of 50 degrees Celsius in Beijing, uh, flash floods in, in North America, uh, look at floods in Pakistan. Um, these are all levelers. Uh, although I would say within limits, the privileged, the rich, still manage to immunize themselves from the consequences in some way. 
yeah, unless they happen to live in Maldives, say. Uh, but in terms of causes, uh, you know, climate change is driven by, by you know, uh, inequalities, ecological asymmetries, which was implicit in, in your lecture. Now, these inequalities are intertemporal mm, uh, between rich countries who, who industrialize on the basis of fossil fuels and developing countries who produce primary commodities. These are interspatial uh, between the North and the Global South, uh, between the cities and the countryside. And these are interpersonal, yeah? Uh, because emitters uh, are, are highly concentrated mm, uh, in countries amongst the rich. It's not entirely a rich poor country thing, uh, but there is that. And what we have now, uh, you are the exception. And those who are concerned about the environment exception, we have a situation in which, you know, there's an old play of Bertolt Brecht, the, the East German playwright, who said, those who have eaten their fill speak to the hungry of the wonderful times to come. So it's for it's for it's for the poor to adjust, poor countries, poor people. Uh, that's the first point. Uh, the second point, uh, and you know. I don't know urbanization well enough. I don't know the environment well enough. Uh, but, but I'm an economist who thinks differently. And I'm, in that sense, I'm a social scientist. But should we not everywhere in the global south be thinking of moving away from megacities and decentralize urbanization? Uh, the the problem, you see, whether it's it's we can think of of water, we can think of storage, we can think of mass transit, we can think of the kind of housing that's came, coming up, and all of the that needs correction. But the problem is hugely compounded in mega cities, um, so that if we were to experiment, uh, you know, we are not the United States, we are not Europe, uh, uh, and China has actually emulated in its big cities the same model. Could we consider a decentralization of urbanization where you, if you build new cities uh, or larger towns, water, sewerage, mass transit, uh, housing, you know, everything can be planned for. Uh, but the easier said than done. I recognize that urbanization is driven on the one hand uh, by markets and real estate developers in the most haphazard manner. And on the other side, uh, by increasing excess demand for housing from those who are resident, from those who are migrants. Uh, and governments in this are not the planners they should be, are not the regulators they should be, but they are collaborators. They are sharing the rents from it. Uh, but if we had smaller cities, the problem could be easier. I'm not sure it, it would be. Uh, third, I mean, NIMBY is the most popular phrase in, in the United States, now not in my backyard, uh, but it is essentially what I would call a socialization of costs and a privatization of benefits. So that if I'm imposing costs, hmm, it's somebody else's problem. Hmm. Uh, and if I'm deriving benefits, that's mine alone. Yeah. Uh, and this, therefore, needs uh, 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 intervention by the state, by the government, in markets. Uh, unfortunately, the ideology and the theology of our times has moved in the opposite direction that markets know best. Uh, last but not least, and I won't talk about this, I hope I'll talk about it tomorrow at the end, that in my view, what is inclusive is sustainable, and what is sustainable is inclusive. Absolutely. There is a close interdependence between the two. Uh, and uh, the more inequality you have, the less inclusive it is and the less sustainable it is. So uh, with that, let me thank you once again, you. most warmly uh, for this wonderful evening.
This brings us to the end of this very engaging, very enriching lecture. Thank you so much, Mr. Nita Narayan, for this Bye. lecture Bye. and Bye. Professor Deepak Tayo for sharing Bye. this session. And uh, everyone sitting in the audience, I will stand between you and the dinner. <laughs> so this brings us to the day Dinner's proceedings. I would just say that uh, the next lecture in the series is on 19th October by Dr. Indamit Gill of World Bank. See you uh, tomorrow. The uh, tomorrow the session will start sharp at 9 a.m. Would request all of you to please join us here in this very hall for the plenary session on making Indian cities dynamic and inclusive. Thank you very much and good night. And Dinner is served. Please join us for drinks and dinner outside. Thank you very much.